Hello and welcome to the Coaching Podcast, coaching for success in sport and business. Your host is Emma Doyle, the energy and high performance under pressure coach who is a world leader in unleashing human potential. Buckle up for this high octane session. Let them have it, coach. G'day, everybody, and welcome to the Coaching Podcast. I am so excited today to be interviewing somebody who is very dear to me, actually, because we've known each other since I was his learning facilitator, and we quite often get young game changers on the podcast. So Mario Matichek, he is the director and head coach of Spark Tennis. He's dedicated to the art of tennis coaching transforming players' lives one serve at a time. He is one of the most passionate, dedicated, and lifelong learners to the sport, and he's very, very driven, uh, and he's very, very values-based. I always say you're an old head on young shoulders, and we love getting young, new insights, Mario. So thank you so much for being on the show. And the first question is, uh, fruits or veggies? What, what's your, what do you prefer? I definitely would prefer uh, fruits for sure. Nice, nice. Well, listen, uh, let's start with your journey. Like I know you've got the the Croatian background, and let's let's go first with your playing career, Mario. I know you were brought up perhaps in a way where you have you know parents. So I've known your life story for for a while, but you know where that Eastern European mentality of work hard, train hard, and the rest will happen. Is that true or what's your take on how you grew up in playing tennis? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, first things first, that is probably quite accurate in regards to, you know, work hard and everything else works itself out. It's definitely, um, you know, that's a value that a lot of Eastern European parents will definitely try and instill in their kids. Um, there's no shortcuts. There's no easy answers. Um, and it can be like a bit of a double-edged sword because sometimes the harder you work, you can dig a bigger hole for yourself, right? Right. Yeah, that's just cold, like a cultural thing. That's how they were raised. And yeah, as we know, like a generational thing would be for all parents to see a therapist and work through those things, but not necessarily the case. And my mum and dad both instilled those values into me for tennis. Uh, I, I started tennis when I was probably three and then just fell in love with the game. You know, I was actually talking to my very, very first coach and he mentioned my dad being like a tennis parent that would stay very, very close to the net and monitor what's actually happening on the court from a young age. I couldn't remember that, but when I spoke to my dad, he's like, yeah, that's how I was like that. I let, I struggled to let go of control and, you know, that's something that he can recognise and realise, so it's, it's good. So three years of age, is that too young to start tennis or what's your take now on kids coming to you, you know, parents coming to you with kids that young and saying, I want to play tennis. What are your thoughts on that? Like we obviously run a tennis coaching business. Like that's what we advertise as, but for that age from two, like we start as young as two. So let's say two to five, um, you know, it's mainly fundamental motor skills that we try and focus on. So it's setting them up for other sports that they can, you know, add into their life and become good at. So, you know, locomotion, which is simply just movement, throw and catch, like projection and reception skills, you know, striking. But striking doesn't just have to be with a tennis racket. It can be with a cricket bat. It can be with your foot or with a soccer ball. It can be kicking a football. Uh, so that's, you know, in our programs, that's what we teach. So it's not strictly just tennis. Uh, we try and develop the, you know, the individual to become a very good athlete. And mm. I'm sure that's like that's pretty popular now in regards to athlete development, probably across the globe. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. I mean, honestly, I'm so passionate about that. And I know you and I talk a lot about that yeah. age group and you hit the nail on the head. It's about setting kids up to fall in love with any sport, isn't it? And not being too specialized, too young. I mean, we, we hear about Andy Murray and uh, Rafa and, and these types of players who could have played soccer right up until they were even 12 to 13. And then they've got the choice of which, which sport to play. Did you play other sports growing up? Uh, just a little bit of soccer training um, mainly, but like it always related back to tennis. Like I knew that I wanted to play tennis, but we tried to figure out, um, you know, how do we improve other skills? It wasn't actually done intentionally. I, I don't believe I had the coaches or like my dad had the knowledge 
to actually know that, but it was just done because, you know, I needed to be more agile or build my endurance. And my dad wanted to find fun ways for me to, to do that. So he knew a um, soccer coach that was, you know, coaching at a local Croatian club in Geelong. So I joined them and also swimming. So I think everyone in Australia does swimming from a young age because, yeah, they don't want their they want their child to learn how to swim and go to the beach and swimming pools and all that type of stuff. So, Mario, let's go to now your journey around becoming a coach. Was there a like was there a moment in time where you were like, "This is what I want to do," like coaching's it, or was it around you maximized your playing and then you fell into coaching or? what's your coaching story? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, it probably, I started doing paid hits slash coaching from a young age, like 14 to 16, as an example, with some other kids. And I really enjoyed the giving back aspect at the time. Didn't really look at it as, as coaching as such, but I enjoyed when someone would ask me for some feedback or some guidance, you know, I'd be quickly able to give them something. Um, I remember when I, when I first met you, like I observed like a technical um, it might've been something on someone's forehand and you said, yeah, that's a good eye, like good technical eye, but it's something I've always, I've always had. So I could pick up on things, but then I, yeah, I maximized my playing potential. I was probably about 20 or 21. And then I fell out of love with the travel of trying to play professional tennis. And I was actually enjoying being on the court coaching at that time, even when I was playing against, you know, let's say my competitors, you know, they would ask for advice or feedback and I would be more than willing to help them out. So that's how I kind of knew that coaching was probably going to be my pathway. And yeah, I, I've always had a desire and love for the game. So I studied the game from a young age and, and I still do like the game's always evolving and changing. So as a coach, you got to keep up with the times. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, someone once said to me that it changes every six months, but I think it's probably even faster than <laughs> than than six months these days. So you have a thirst for learning. Uh, we've been on a learning journey together as as um as mentees and mentors. Where does that come from? That that spark, shall we say, spark tennis <laughs> for your your curiosity and your your lifelong passion for learning? Yeah, I think the lifelong passion for lifelong learning has definitely come from my parents. Like my dad in particular has always been someone that has asked a lot of questions. And, you know, if someone would say something, he would listen to it, but then want to know why. So I think I picked up from that as a, at a young age and I've always kind of done the same thing. Um, and now I encourage all of our students to ask as many questions as possible because, you know, that way they're actually paying attention and you as a coach have to actually be able to break down the reasons and the why behind what you're doing. And that's, that's how a business ultimately should probably be ran, like run. Like everyone's got their own vision and you have to stick to that as like a, as a framework that you come back to uh, when it comes to making tough decisions. But overall, like, yeah, I think it, it is customer feedback that actually helps you learn about the market. Also, I want to pick up on in your language there, just what, when I told our listeners earlier that you're you're this wise soul on on this young you know these young shoulders is because you spoke about principles and you spoke about philosophy because you've always had strong principles and strong philosophies in terms of what you expect uh, you do work with a number of high performance players so i know we've had many discussions over the years about how do you be more flexible with your with your coaching approach, yet stay true to your principles in terms of what you believe to be important. I, I don't know what my question is, by the way. I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking out loud about how wonderful it is to say you have to listen to the needs of your people, of your customers, and you have to stay true to your values. Yes. So how do you navigate that that slippery slope? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, especially like when it comes down to if we're talking about high performance in this aspect, um, you have to understand their needs and you have to be able to, as a coach, you have to be able to listen extremely well and then figure out if it's actually the right fit. Um, if that's something that you want to be a part of, if does that work for your lifestyle? Are you able to commit to that person based on the vision of your business or the vision of your life? And if you can't, you simply just have to let them know and be honest and and if you can then even better the way that i would do it like yeah that's 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 kind of the frameworks that i use when i come down to making tough decisions when it comes to making tough decisions anyway mm. 
but yeah, so obviously you're going to get different answers from all different areas, but especially when it comes to seeking feedback, but ultimately you make the decision at the end of what's, what's relevant to you and what's relevant to your business and your mm. mission. Sounds like you must have read what makes a great coach there. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That was a shameless plug on the book. If anyone hasn't, <laughs> hasn't read it, of course, listing features very highly as one of the top 10 practices. So let's go there next. Let's go to our guiding question, Mario, in one to a maximum of three words. And you know, I've asked you this question many a times. Yes. Uh, what do you think makes a great coach? And could you provide an example of each of those qualities for us? Yeah. Absolutely. So curiosity comes as number one for me, because like you have to be curious about yourself, about the game, about the individual in front of you. Um, and that kind of links to empathy as well. Like you have to be able to put yourself in the player's shoes and the student's shoes, because at the end of the day, if you can't do that, what you're trying to deliver won't get across in the most positive and best way, I believe anyway. Um, someone who listens as well, like is a, is a huge one. So those would be my top three because yeah, like I don't know how you could provide great coaching practices without without being able to implement those. So like I could list off 10. I think there's more than just three, but um, they would be my top three for sure. Mm, curiosity, empathy, and listening. And would you say when we first met, at the junior development coaching course, <laughs> I don't even know how many years ago that was. 2016. To, thank you. Uh, would you say those three things was is something that you are evolving over the years to come to that today? Like, in other words, how have you grown from the junior development coaching course to the coach you are today? Yeah, great question. Uh, that has definitely evolved. I believe when I first started coaching, it was kind of um, centered around me and what I thought was important, what I wanted to do. So like, like I was young, so, you, you know, coming off the tour and a lot of um, players trying to reach professional level, like it is based around yourself and ego driven and you do have to back yourself no matter what. Um, and then when you go into coaching, you become the second most important person. The person in front of you becomes the most important. So you have to understand how you can deliver what they want. Absolutely, um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely been a, like an evolution of my own growth and, yeah, my coaching philosophy. Mm. So what advice have you got out there for young coaches listening? Like what are your top three tips if they were back where you were? How can yep. they grow especially quickly. Like I know we can't speed up time. I'm always talking to you about confidence equals time plus experience, which is our, our favorite coaching formula as it relates to confidence. Yeah. But I know that young people want to move fast. They want to, they want to become a great coach as quick as they can. So what are your top three tips for somebody listening? Who's young thinking like that? Yeah, like I would break it down to always try and go to bed each night being a little bit wiser than when you woke up. Um, and that kind of links to, you know, approaching each day as a beginner, like you have to actually accept the fact that you know very little. And even if you know a lot, I think that mindset actually kind of helps you to continue learning and learning and evolving. Like I have learned a lot over the last five or six years, but like I'll still come to you and ask you some questions that may be like really simplistic because I just want to understand it on an even deeper level. I think you, I remember you once mentioned to me, you know, the best coaches in the world are just really good at the basics, like exceptional at the basics. So true. And, and yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. I don't mm. think you need to complicate it too much. Um, I just think if you can approach it the right way from your own point of view and just learn a little bit more each day, you'll do well. Mm. Just one last message I want to leave for coaches, especially for young coaches, is to look at your life 30 to 40 years from now and then plan backwards. A few simple questions to ask yourself would be, what and who do I want to be when I grow up? What's my ideal life? What's my ideal career or business? And from there, you work backwards. You create a step-by-step -step plan. By doing this, it's going to allow you to look forward and then plan accordingly to achieve your vision in all areas of your life. The point of this podcast, I believe, isn't to give the listeners answers, but to give them frameworks on how to think better. One of our guests, uh, shout out to Bob Litwin, he, there's a word called shoshin, which means a beginner's mind. 
And I love that you just said that because when we take that approach of even though we know a lot, but to have a beginner's mindset, it allows us to almost like not fail. I mean, we fail every day, but it allows us to fail because if you're a beginner, obviously you're constantly failing so you can learn, but you don't feel bad when you're a beginner. <laughs> yes. Yeah, have exactly you, right. Yeah. Have you ever learned something recently that where you felt like a beginner? Every day, like especially when it comes down to like I, like you and I talk a lot about communication styles and understanding communication styles. So I feel like a complete beginner in that because I'm all like kids are learning in such a different way these days that I have to put myself in their shoes, which is how do I, how do they learn? How do I get this message across in a clear way that they are going to understand? And yeah, so that's definitely an area that I'm so passionate about and and continue to put my beginner hat on. Mm. And I went lawn bowling recently. <laughs> you know, how that's like fun to do now <laughs> here in Australia. And that's like, I'm telling you, that's not that easy. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. All right. Well, let's go to our season six question, which is what disruptive idea do you have that would change the coaching landscape in 2030, which isn't actually that far away. I might have to push, I might have to push it out a little bit further, but for now, your that's that's a question for you, Mario. What are your thoughts on that in the coaching landscape? I love it. I yeah, I, I think um, you know, having mandatory courses where for tennis coaches they need to do a psychology course and a communications course, only to uh that way they can actually understand themselves, they can understand people better, what drives emotions, um, and clear delivery methods. I find I, I, I've seen it. I've done it myself in particular. Like you, you can use very complex words to sound extremely smart, but the student won't under, actually understand what you're trying to talk or trying to deliver. So yeah, that, that, that would be, that that's kind of like what I think would change the game. Yeah. It's a bit like when you throw something in chat GPT and it spits it back out and you go, that's actually not what I was thinking at all. <laughs> yeah, that's it. like it sometimes writes it in such a way that it's trying to sound too intelligent I know that sounds really silly but I love it when I'm like no that's not how my brain would have said that or think that so no I'm not going to use that but I'll take a little bit of it and rewrite it. it so I, I do think technology plays a huge part you're great with your marketing and uh, you know the spark tennis logo and your your development and mental pathway is fantastic. What are your uh, top tips for us older coaches potentially? I, I can't believe I threw myself in that <laughs> bucket. Let me reframe that. Uh, what are your top tips for some of uh, us more experienced coaches around social media? How can we do a better job and learn from you lovely young people? Yeah, again, I think it comes down to understanding the market that you're trying to penetrate and understanding what they actually want to see um and then altering your message to fit their needs or something that they're going to be interested in so again it comes through trial and error um and you do this exceptionally well like you know you produce a lot of great content um that's got the captions on there as well their videos so they're short and sharp and straight to the point like we we tend to watch a lot of things rather than read a lot of things so yeah making videos that are actually going to add value to people's lives as long as that's what they're interested in that's great advice. Thank you so much for that. And finally, I want to talk about your vision for the future. Like what's next for Spark Tennis? What's next for Mario Matichek? Yeah, so just, again, continuing to just try and get a little bit better every single day. Um, the vision in regards to the business aspect hasn't changed. We're trying to be a positive influence and a positive platform for everyone that comes into our program. So the more people we can get playing tennis, you know, and staying in tennis for life, that's something that we definitely try and do. And just sport in general. And then by doing that, we're trying to create an environment that nurtures that, that enforces that. Um, and as you as you mentioned earlier, you know, starting as young as two, and getting them to love sport and have a, a, have that healthy lifestyle. Um, yeah. So in regards to the vision, that that would be that's that's what we're trying to do. In regards to personal, it's just trying to get a little bit better every day. Mm. Well, sometimes on the podcast, it's great for us just to hear such powerful and simple message, but important message about 
people like yourself who are game changers and you're coming through. You're the next generation of people leading this industry. And I also love that you, while you're a passionate tennis coach, you're also a passionate business person. You're not just a one-dimensional coach. There's so many elements to you and to Spark Tennis that you're always thinking deeply about how can you make the product better and how can you make it more attractive so that people fall in love with being healthy and being the best version of themselves possible. Uh, Ignite your potential is your tagline. So I just want to say how much I appreciate you, how much I enjoy our conversations. We've had so many over the years and we still have them today. And it it really is an honor to, to mentor you and, uh, you mean, yeah, you mean a lot to me. So I just wanted to take that moment to to thank you, Mario, for who you are as a person. That's very kind, Em. And I want to thank you as well for, um, you know, taking that step with me in 2016. Uh, I probably wasn't easy to deal with back then coming off the tour, tour and, you know, maybe believing I know more than I did. So like, you know, you approached it the right way. You've changed. I, like, I'm so lucky that uh, the very first mentor and the mentor that I still have today has helped me see the world in a different way. So like the whole one dimensional aspect, you know, my hat goes, goes off to you. Like you've taught me to look at it from a different lens. And that's really what the coaching podcast is all about. It really is like the reason I do this and the reason, and sometimes it's not always easy, full transparency. This interview is happening on a Saturday. We're both giving <laughs> up our time and it's not always easy, but the the essence of being able to provide a platform where no matter where you are in the world, you can access this show, Coach for Success in Sport and Business, and how we can merge the two together and find similarities and differences is really the secret source to the show. So it's not possible without yeah without uh, without our wonderful guests. So just thanks again, everybody, and I really appreciate uh, the self awareness the. The fact that in 2030, there's going to be psychology and communication in coaching courses <laughs> around the world and and clear delivery methods, so, so important so that we can all fall in love with it, the healthy lifestyle that is, um, yeah. Thank you again, Mario. Thank you, Emma. All right. And thanks everyone for listening. The Coaching Podcast is sponsored by Transition Coach for Athletes, a global coaching, mentoring and U.S. college sporting scholarship placement service. The service helps athletes navigate the often challenging world of choosing your best college fit while maximizing sports performance. Visit www.transitioncoachforathletes.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating review on your podcast listening device. And don't forget to tell a fellow coach about the show. The ball is in your court to take action and enjoy your coaching.